I'm showing 10 o'clock. Um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everybody for coming to the 10 of the top upstate professional planners meeting for February 24th, 2021. Um, my name is Michael Foreman. Um, I'm co-chair of the, uh, the upstate professional planners uh, group um, with Phil Lindler, who is on the call as well. Uh, Phil will be speaking a little bit uh, later um, after our presentation, but uh, first and foremost, I wanted to uh, thank our sponsors, uh, Milliken and Rewa, for this event. Always great to have them sponsor these events. Um, and, and Justine, I don't believe either of the representatives are here to speak. Is that correct? Okay, well, we'll move right in then to the, the main portion of our, of our program, um, the Freedom Mobility Plan presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to Michael Hild Hildebrand, the Upstate Mobility Alliance Executive Director. Uh, no. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. And thanks for everybody being here this morning. Uh, so I, I recognize a lot of names and uh, some of this information may not be new because some of you have heard this, uh, but I think this is a really good discussion and this group's input uh, really would be helpful for us. So um, for those of you that don't know the Mobility Alliance, we have four task forces that focus on different elements of transportation and mobility. Uh, one of those task forces is the Moving People Task Force, which um, has developed a, a program that uh, we are really excited about. And we think this program will help to encourage people to uh, move and travel in ways other than just using uh, their own car. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew, who uh, works for Greenlink, but also is on the Moving People Task Force. And he's going to review this this program that we've developed and uh, looking for your input. And so thank you for the time. I'll turn it over to Matthew. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Let me start sharing my screen here. Okay. Um, sorry, I think I'm, let me... Share. There we go. Can everyone see the presentation or is it showing the yep. desktop? Okay. All right. Well, as Michael um, mentioned, this is a presentation that's about something we're calling the Alternative Mobility Freedom Index uh, or program. We're kind of still playing around a little with the language here. Um, but as Michael had mentioned, a, a big part of this program is kind of addressing a question of how is it that we can encourage uh, the residents and everyone in the upstate to decrease their dependence on single occupant vehicle usage. And so there are obviously a lot of different components into this question, but one of the things that we were trying to address in this program is instead of focusing on all of the areas where there are um, limitations or a lack of infrastructure for alternative forms of transportation, we thought we'd first pay attention to the areas that do have a lot of these facilities that could support alternative modes of transportation and ask the question, how is it that we can encourage the people who live in those areas and who work in those areas to use different forms of transportation that maybe they're not utilized utilizing right now or to, to use them more than they are currently. And so um, we've come up with this alternative mobility identification system that has to do a lot with starting to map and kind of identify the areas that do provide these alternative mobility options. And then our hope is to give neighborhoods access to this information so that not only are they better educated and more aware of these uh, alternatives so that they can use them, but then they also have the opportunity to um, advocate with their local governments or SCBOT or whoever the entity might be to make continued improvements and to further expand their options in these areas. And so the, the discussion that we're really hoping to have with you all today um, kind of gets into this question of, this program is very much focused on a neighborhood by neighborhood evaluation basis. And in order for this program to succeed throughout the upstate and not just in Greenville or a couple of the main areas, 
um, we'll need to draw upon a lot of what you all can bring, which is your local knowledge, all the information and resources that you have, and also just the relationships that you have with members in your community that would be able to help support and initiate these types of efforts. And so if you're participating in this, um, there is some GIS information that will be needed. Um, and so we have a, a list of it here, uh, just a review. So one is neighborhood boundaries. Um, our hope is to use this program in officially designated neighborhoods and not be trying to come up with boundaries or areas ourselves, but something that's already recognized in the community as an official neighborhood. And then within that neighborhood, we'll be looking for property parcels, street center lines, sidewalks, bus stops, if there are any, um, bicycle infrastructure, such as existing bicycle lanes or sharrows or possibly even bike routes, um, and then also trails and multi-use paths. And we'll go through in the coming slides showing how all that information is utilized. Um, but before we kind of get into the full evaluation, um, we have established something of a, a threshold program that would allow us to focus our efforts on neighborhoods and areas in the upstate that are most likely to kind of fit into this vision and to this possibility. And so we've established three different kind of categories of thresholds that we would be asking neighborhoods to um, kind of pass before they continue on. And that's street network density, average parcel size, and then community engagement activity. And so we'll briefly kind of discuss each of those. So the first threshold category is street network density. And the, the reason that we're focusing on this is um, that basically that neighborhoods that have high levels of street connectivity are better able to support uh, non-automotive transportation. So I imagine most of you are familiar with diagrams like the one that's shown here on the right. Um, that basically demonstrates that a neighborhood that has a high level of street connectivity, like the one on the bottom, uh, not only provides shorter routes between any two points typically, but it also provides more routes that just give uh, bicyclists and pedestrians and in turn transit users more options to get from any one place to another place in their neighborhood without an automobile. Whereas if a neighborhood has low connectivity, um, the, the routes are usually longer, they're more heavily traveled, and it's just more difficult for non-automotive users to, to move around. So there are a lot of different ways that um, you can evaluate network density. I, mean, I think there are even different add-ons that you can have with ArcGIS that will do things like network analysis. But for kind of a, just a basic measurement of this that hopefully everyone will be able to access, we've come up with this simple formula, which basically looks at the total number of miles of roadway within a neighborhood, and then divides it by the land area in square miles of that neighborhood to come up with this uh, roadway miles per square mile uh, figure. And the threshold that we've established is that a neighborhood needs to have 15 miles of roadway per square mile of land area to qualify for this. And so to just kind of see this in an example, we'll be using this neighborhood quite a bit, but this is the Nickel Town neighborhood in, uh, in Greenville, which is just kind of to the Southeast of downtown. It's one of the older neighborhoods in the city. Um, we're running a, something of a pilot program with them as we're developing this, this whole program. And so in Nickel Town, um, what you'll see is that there are just over 20 miles of streets in the neighborhood. Um, and the total land area within the official neighborhood boundaries is 1.05 square miles. So we put that into our little formula and find that this street network density, as we've defined it, is 19.6 street miles per square mile of land area, which qualifies for this threshold that we've established. Um, one tip on this, this was kind of a point that we went back and forth as we were developing on, but um, as you're selecting street segments to include in a neighborhood, we are including any streets that form boundaries of the neighborhood in the, as part of this neighborhood street network. So all of the different thresholds kind of are assuming that that's being included. Um, so do that if you're, if you're evaluating a neighborhood for this program. 
the second category that we're looking at is average parcel size. And this is really just a easy way, a kind of a shorthand way to look at the development density within a neighborhood. Because um, obviously as parcel sizes are smaller, development density tends to be uh, greater and which just basically means that origins and destinations within the neighborhood are more likely to be closer together, which obviously is um, a way of supporting non-automotive transportation. And so our measurement of this is really just looking at the average parcel sizes of, in the neighborhood. And we've established a threshold that neighborhoods that will qualify for this program should have an average parcel size of half of an acre or less. So looking at, again at our Nickel Town example, um, all we did is we clipped out and selected all of the parcels within the neighborhood and used GIS to uh, look at the attribute data to determine the average parcel size within that neighborhood. And for Nickel Town, that came out to be just over one third of an acre, which again qualifies uh, for the thresholds that we've established. And this is something that I'm sure everyone would figure out. Um, but for example, in the city of Greenville, the parcel data that we were using was reporting land area in square feet rather than acres. Um, and that obviously you can convert those figures over to um, acreage using this conversion of one acre is over 43,000 square feet. So I'm sure everyone would figure that out, but just wanted to flag that that might be something that um, you would run into if you're going through this program. The third category that we're looking at for this initial threshold evaluation is looking at the neighborhood's community engagement activity. Um, and basically a lot of the efforts that would come out of this program, which we'll discuss more in, uh, later in this presentation, uh, involve community engagement programs for advocacy, uh, for awareness and education type events. And in order to do that effectively, we wanna focus on neighborhoods that already are active and engaged um, and that have existing systems that we can plug into uh, in order to support these efforts rather than us coming in and trying to create something from scratch. And so we've created this kind of a basic scoring system um, that can be used to determine the uh, community engagement activity within a neighborhood. And so this scoring system has three different categories. One is looking at the presence of community centers, um, which is official buildings that are used for community meetings. And then we're also looking at different community events. So um, the, the categories here, if the neighborhood has a formal or an informal community center, um, one that everyone recognizes as the place where all the neighborhood events occur, um, that would give the neighborhood five points. Um, and then for both formal and informal community events, uh, so I guess formal events would be something that a neighborhood association is officially sponsoring and holding on a regular basis. Um, and so we are looking at the number of these types of events are, that are held per quarter. Um, and they get a certain point value based on the number of those events that are occurring. And then similarly, it's also looking at the number of informal community events that are held. And this would be things that maybe aren't officially sponsored by the neighborhood, but or type garage sale type events or uh, something like a Halloween trick or treating event that's very well known and a lot of people participate in. Um, and, and we're looking at assigning point values based on the number of these events that are held per quarter. Um, this is, I, I think there's a little bit of wiggle room on these points. Uh, this is just kind of a general guideline that can give us a sense of how active a community is. Um, but obviously there's a little bit of just intuition that can go into this as well. But the, the threshold that we've established is that based on this scoring system, a neighborhood should score 10 or more points throughout these three categories in order to qualify for our program. So as a quick um, little practice exercise, so you don't have to keep hearing me just talk on and on and so that you can engage in this a little bit yourself, um, we've come up with this example exercise where there are three neighborhoods 
completely made up, of course, um, that we have given these attribute datas related to the miles of roadway, uh, the total land area of the neighborhood, average parcel size, and then different figures for these community engagement events. And basically all we want to do is just give you um, one or two minutes to kind of look through these and try to determine which of these neighborhoods would qualify for further evaluation based on these thresholds. And I've provided all of the guidelines that we're using over in this box on the left so that you don't have to be looking back at old uh, the, the, the earlier slides. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna pause here for one or two minutes and let you work through that. And then we'll come back and kind of talk about which ones qualify and which ones do not and why that is. And while we're working through that, just want to reiterate what uh, Justine just mentioned in the chat um, feature that if you do have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and and ask questions or any comments. Um, and then also, uh, if you want to type it out, that would obviously work as well. Okay, I don't want to rush anyone, but um, does anyone want to volunteer which of the neighborhoods um, they think would qualify for this program? I think we might need to ask some specific people here. Oh, don't wanna... it's like... Sherry is volunteering. Yes, um, A and C. Well, um, and I see the uh, question from Carol as well, and we will. Well, uh, um, we'll get to that in one moment. But yes, so as Sherry said, it's neighborhoods A and C, um, and I'll just kind of briefly for neighborhood B, the reason why it wouldn't qualify um, is. Um, that the street network density is um, does not meet our threshold. So it has 15 miles of roadway, but the land area is 1.5 square miles, which means that it has 10 miles of roadway per square mile of land area, which just indicates that the street network is not very connected or robust. And then also the um, community engagement component. It does have some community events, but uh, due to the lack of a community center and the lack of the formal events, it would not uh, qualify for that engagement piece as we've established it. Um, so thank you, Sherry, for volunteering that. Um, so before I go on, um, does anyone, well, I've received a question from Carol, but does anyone also have any questions that they want to present or ask at this point before we move? I will take a moment. So um, I received a question just kind of asking a little more uh, detail about what the Mobility Freedom Program is. And I, um, yes, I kind of pass over that a little quickly at the beginning, but um, the idea of this program is that 
once we go through this whole evaluation process and the scoring process, that we'll be able to um, kind of recognize neighborhoods through some sort of um, a certification program, we're kind of determining exactly what that looks like, but neighborhoods will receive this designation similar to um, there's like the bicycle friendly neighborhood type of a program, that type of an idea where a neighborhood would be able to apply for this uh, program or be uh, nominated for the program and then receive a designation saying that they um, foster this uh, high levels of mobility freedom. They provide a lot of different options uh, to residents in terms of how it is that they'll move around. Um, and so this will both just be a way that the neighborhoods can be recognized for these quali qualities. And then um, they'll also have the opportunity to participate in different education and outreach and advocacy uh, events that will allow them to continue to expand um, their mobility options. Um, so are there any other questions at the moment? If not, I will move on. All right. Um, so once a neighborhood qualifies and passes these thresholds, uh, we then move into this uh, evaluation and analysis zone, which would come out with trying to come up with what we're calling an alternative mobility freedom score. And kind of a note on the freedom, one of the things we're really trying to um, emphasize and lean into with this program is to kind of generate an interest and an understanding of um, mobility options as something that really provide residents with freedom and with choice. There's, I think there's an existing narrative that um, exists in a lot of communities that see freedom and independence as purely being something that comes from having a car and being able to move around with your car however it is you want to go. Um, and that obviously is one kind of freedom, but we want to also acknowledge that neighborhoods that give people multiple options that allow them to choose whether they drive or whether they bike or take the bus or walk that that is also a kind of freedom that gives people a lot of options and that can really increase quality of life, um, be a, an important aspect of quality of life in these neighborhoods. Um, so that's kind of the, why this mobility freedom is, is the type of language we're trying to use here. And so within these scores, um, we're measuring three different primary modes of alternative transportation, one being transit, the next being bicycling, and the third being pedestrian travel. And one note on this that we want to emphasize is that um, while the, the highest scores in our program can only be attained if you have all three, a neighborhood doesn't have to have access to all three forms of these kinds of transportation in order to be recognized in this program. So especially if there's a neighborhood in a smaller community, for example, that has sidewalks and maybe some bike routes, but doesn't have transit, I don't want you to walk away thinking, well, they can't participate in this program. Um, they can participate in this and receive recognition for the amenities that they do provide. So that's just something to keep in mind as we're going through this program. Um, so we'll kind of talk a little bit about each of these scores. Um, the first is we're looking at transit freedom. And within each of these categories, there's both an infrastructure score and a connection score, a connectivity score. So the infrastructure score related to transit is asking what percentage of the parcels within a neighborhood are gonna be located within a quarter mile of a bus stop. And then the connection component of this is asking of these bus stops, how many of them are attached to a sidewalk that allow people to easily access the stops rather than just being um, dropping somebody off in a grass, uh, a grass yard somewhere, for example. So again, we'll return here to Nickeltown and look at this example. The map over on the left, all the green dots that are shown there are bus stops that are located in or around the neighborhood. And then all of the parcels that are highlighted in red are the parcels 
that are located within a quarter mile of these bus stops. So for our infrastructure score, what we determined was that about 89% of the parcels in this neighborhood are located within a quarter mile of the bus stop. And then for the connection score, we looked at all the bus stops, the 32 that are shown on this map, and we determined that 24 of those um, are connected to a sidewalk, that the riders get on and off at a place that has a sidewalk, which means that they have a 75% connection access. And we'll have a, a slide towards the end that um, shows how each of these um, figures are then plugged into a, a formula to come up with the, the mobility score. Um, but for now, I just know that those are the two figures that we're coming in with transit. And then one quick tip as you're going through this, um, we wanna include not only the bus stops that are located within the neighborhood boundaries, but any bus stops that might be uh, located just outside of the neighborhood boundaries, like we kind of show up on the top and the bottom, any that are located within a quarter mile of the neighborhood that might provide residents with access to a bus stop, even if it's not officially within the boundaries. Um, the next component that we're looking at is then bicycling freedom. Um, again, they're the two components of infrastructure and connection. So for infrastructure, the question is what percentage of streets in the neighborhood feature an existing form of bicycle infrastructure, such as bicycle lanes or share roads or a bicycle route that's designated. And then the connection score is asking within these facilities that are available, how many access points do they provide in and out of the neighborhood um, so that residents can use this as a form of transportation beyond the neighborhood. And within that, we're including trail access points, which we'll see in a second applies to neighborhoods like Nickeltown. So looking at this for Nickeltown, um, the red lines that are shown on the map are existing bicycle uh, infrastructure, bicycle lanes or sharrows in the neighborhood. And then the purple lines are trail access. So this is the, the Swamp Rabbit Trail, um, which is obviously quite well known in Greenville. And so there are a couple access points that provide Nickeltown with direct, direct access to the score, to, to the trails, excuse me. And so looking at this, um, well, first with the infrastructure score, uh, the, the total length of these bicycle lanes or sharrows in the neighborhood is 1.3 miles. And that's out of about 20 miles of street length in the neighborhood which means that about 6% of streets in the neighborhood feature some sort of uh, marked bicycle infrastructure. And then the connection points, looking at how many of access points in and out of the neighborhood, the trails or these bicycle lanes provide, um, we determined that there, each of these uh, bicycle routes is, serves as one connection point. And then there are a couple uh, trail access points that count as well. So there are four bicycle access points and again, we'll look at how that plugs into the formula in a second. And then the last category we're looking at is pedestrian freedom. So the infrastructure score here is what percentage of street edges in the neighborhood feature sidewalks. And um, for this, we're, we're calculating it based on street edges rather than street center lines. So any one mile of street obviously can have two miles of sidewalks. Uh, potentially provided along it if there's sidewalk along both sides of the street. So um, we're looking at the total length of the street in the neighborhood times two to determine um, the, the total uh, percentage of uh, sidewalk availability in the neighborhood. And then similar to the bicycle infrastructure score for the connection here, we're asking how many different access points do these sidewalks and trails provide for pedestrians in and out of the neighborhood. So returning to our Nickel Town example, um, we have the sidewalks marked here on the map in this kind of the, the light orange lines. And again, the trails are the purple lines. And so the infrastructure score, we determined there uh, almost 13 and a half miles of existing sidewalk in the neighborhood um, out of a potential 41 miles of street edges in the neighborhood which means that there are about 30, 
about 33% of the street edges in the neighborhood feature sidewalks. And then for connection scores, we just went around and counted the number of uh, access points that these provide in and out of the neighborhood and determined that there were 16. So all of these figures finally come into this uh, table. And there are a few formulas in here, which we don't need to go over right now. If you're curious, we can certainly have that conversation later. Um, but it, this table takes all these infrastructure and connection scores that we've just gone through and plugs them into formulas. And it comes up with access scores for each of the categories. And then the most important thing is up here at the top, um, they're used to come up with an alternative mobility freedom score, which in the case of Nickeltown was 6.3. And then that plugs in to this freedom scale that we've kind of come up with that shows how that score relates to different categories of, um, of, of freedom access that we, uh, that a neighborhood might have, of low, moderate, high, or complete independence. And so in the case of Nickeltown, their score puts them into the moderate mobility freedom category. And so the question of course is where does all this end up going? And so for a neighborhood that gets a score of moderate or above, what we're proposing is that um, there would be a, a kind of a partnership formed with upstate mobility um, and that would serve several purposes. So first is that we would help the neighborhood perform a mobility assessment to look at the existing infrastructure and to come up with something like a one page strategic plan that would first highlight areas where this infrastructure could be improved or what the, the um, what types of improvements would be most important for the neighborhood to uh, complete in the, the near future. Um, and then also connected with that, maybe identify different grant programs or uh, infrastructure improvement programs that they could draw upon in order to uh, have funds to complete those improvements. Along with that, we would help support different campaigns that could be held um, within the neighborhood that would be used to educate and encourage people to ride buses or to bike more or walk more, whatever the focus might be that the neighborhood wants to emphasize. Uh, we would also, of course, have this advocacy training, uh, again, connecting neighborhood residents in with both the resources and strategies that they could use to advocate for their neighborhood for additional improvements to be made. Um, and then the, the goal is that through all of this, um, that we might be able to, to create a heightened awareness and appreciation within the neighborhood of these mobility options and to give the neighborhood a plan, game plan as far as how they will move forward to continue to make improvements and to continue to encourage their residents to use these options as they're available to them. Um, and so one last slide before we get into any questions that you all might have. Um, we are currently working with Nickeltown kind of as a pilot uh, program, uh, practicing kind of what this would look like to work with a neighborhood to, to create this program. And so we're hoping to complete this within the next month or two. Um, but we're going to do that before we officially kind of present this as an option throughout the upstate. Um, and so we want you to know that this is coming in the near future, but it's not something that we're officially announcing just yet. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any feedback or suggestions, um, we're, we would absolutely welcome them. Um, and we'd be curious to know if there are any things that you think that we should keep in mind as we're, uh, thinking about how we would be able to take this to communities throughout the upstate. Um, and then we would encourage you before this is officially um, brought into your communities, if it does sound like something that you're interested in and that there are neighborhoods that would qualify for it, just to be thinking about what some of those areas, what some of those neighborhoods might be um, that might be able to, to fit well and be good participants in this program. Um, and with that, I think that's everything that I have to share. So if there are any questions for myself or Michael, we would welcome that.
And otherwise, I'll be giving this presentation to Justine, so she'll be able to share it with the group uh, if you want to look over it on your own time as well. Do we have any questions? From um, yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, can, I, can I be here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, um, so I see that you have your um, index, which is an Excel spreadsheet, which is, which is really, really cool. Um, and you set it on Nickel Town. Okay, fine. Um, before you go ahead and you start doing this analysis, is it possible to evaluate, well, for one thing, do you have a shape file for every neighborhood and subdivision in the entirety of Greenville County, or at least in the areas where transit reaches? We um, currently, we have, I believe it's all the neighborhood shape files um, that are participating in, I forget the exact term for it, but the, the city of Greenville has kind of the special emphasis neighborhoods. Um, so that's the, was the shape file we used to determine um, Nickel Town. And we do not currently have the city's complete neighborhood shape file system. Do you have the ability to get a hold of the city's complete uh, neighborhood shape file system? Uh, yes, well, well, we haven't reached out, but I'm assuming that that's available. The reason why I ask this question is because right now you're focusing on these special emphasis neighborhoods, which I think will amount to maybe about you know, six, maybe six to 10 neighborhoods, um, which doesn't cover not even half of the city of Greenville, um, let alone, you know, the parts of the transit system that reach outside of Greenville. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Yes. Okay. So before you go ahead and move forward with um, selecting even neighbor, um, one neighborhood like Na uh, Nickel Town, why not evaluate every neighborhood um, that you have a shape file for with this matrix before deciding which neighborhood you would um, try to evaluate? Does that make sense? Because wouldn't this... Um, Yes, it, it, ahead, it does make sense. We, so the reason we reached out to Nickel Town initially is that um, we have uh, at Greenlink, because of the, the high transit access um, that it has, we have established relationships with a lot of their neighborhood leaders. We know that they've been very active in addressing um, a lot of questions related to uh, these different infrastructure components. And so we thought that given our existing relationship and their previous experience and their knowledge of all of these issues, that they would be able to um, kind of help us better understand what this would look like in terms of how we could uh, engage neighborhoods and what concerns or questions the neighborhoods might have. And so I think that the that, that's just our pilot program so that they can kind of help us identify what those points would be. After we've gone through that process with them, I think that we would definitely be looking at doing something like you're saying of um, evaluating all the neighborhoods, but it was just kind of the, uh, the, the easiest starting point for us that seemed like it would be beneficial as we're just forming the, the program itself. Okay, I see. This is Michael. I'd also like to add um, a couple of reasons why we focused in on Nickel Town to start with. Uh, two reasons. Number one is because they have um, historically been very engaged in their um, activities, in their community activities. So, so they were a, they were a community that we knew already had high levels of engagement and um, would be interested in. And, and we thought they would be interested in this program. And so we wanted to reach out to them uh, because like Matthew said, we do want a neighborhood that we can kind of uh, test this on to make sure that it makes sense. And then in a neighborhood that, that historically already has some, some background. I mean, you know, Matthew showed their neighborhood plan that I think they did in 2010. I think that was when that was done. So, so they already had a history there and they already had a, a foundational knowledge, but then, also, um, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to bring this presentation to this group is because we wanted um, other communities to be looking at their neighborhoods and, and trying to identify, is there a neighborhood that they want to pilot this well? Because, um, 
you know, we want to make sure that we get this, we get it right, but we really roll it out. And so by focusing on a neighborhood that we know that has engagement um, is, is a good way to get started. And we, we would just encourage others on this call to do the same. You know, look, look at a neighborhood that maybe uh, you think meets these criteria, you know that have some really good engagement and would be interested in it work from there instead of having to go through all of the neighborhoods that you have in a community. Um, so that, that was the thought process behind that. Um, okay. Um, I understand what you're saying, the idea of being able to engage communities in the future. Um, I think it goes back to my original question. Um, with the matrix that you came up with, why not just simply evaluate all neighborhoods that you could possibly evaluate and then present it to every neighborhood and then it, it gives you a foot into all those neighborhoods potentially to advertise this potential project. Because it seems right now you're just picking a neighborhood and you're trying not to see if it's going to work there, as opposed to giving neighborhoods, every neighborhood that could potentially benefit an opportunity to engage in the process. That's what I'm getting at. So, for example, if you're trying to evaluate these places for like walking, biking, and transit infrastructure, um, you're making the assumption that neighborhood is the best place. Maybe it is. But if you haven't evaluated these other places, how do you know that's true? Other than you have great relationships with, with this particular neighborhood. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and, and some of it, frankly, just comes down to, to time and manpower. Um, you know, the, the time that it takes to evaluate the neighborhood. Um, you know, I, Matthew's the one that did it. But I think it's several hours at least per neighborhood. And um, so, you know, we want to, you know, I definitely hear what you're saying, but we want to make sure that we, uh, we started off on a good foot and um, frankly, you know, use our time and resources towards a neighborhood that we at least believe would be uh, engaged around this to help have a, to have a successful demonstration so that when it does go broader, we have a, a model neighborhood that we can point to. Matthew, this is Phil Lundler. Um, do you see your mobility freedom program being used uh, perhaps eventually as a part of the review process that local governments may use to utilize during an approval process for maybe new residential developments or uh, an infill residential project in an existing neighborhood? Well, I, I'll also let Michael speak to this. I, I think that those types of um, connections and uses would be something that we would love to see, like if, if it was able to gain enough kind of um, momentum and support throughout the upstate, we would love for local governments to consider this or something like it as they're looking at development practices and thinking about um, just to be cognizant of all of these issues as they're reviewing new developments and thinking about where they want to make their new investments. It, right now, I don't believe that that is uh, a stated goal of the program, um, but it is, it is, is certainly kind of one of these long-term impacts that we would hope that this would have. Michael, do you have anything else you'd want to say on that? Yeah, no, I mean, Phil, that's a good question. And uh, whether it's it's used exclusively or in, in conjunction with some other things, that would be great. Um, I think that, you know, if we can develop a, a system that, that is beneficial to the municipalities and the counties, that, that would, I, I would love to see that. And so, um, you know, any kind of feedback that you or others on the call have that would help make this program, you know, how to tailor it so that it would be beneficial for those kinds of uses um, would be really great. One of the things that, the Active and Livable Communities Task Force is working on right now is a, is a short trip survey. So their definition of that would be uh, trips two miles or less. And so that would be um, one of the resources we would offer to these neighborhoods would be uh, surveys. And so the short trip survey that um, ask the community members to uh, tell us how do they take their short trips and what kind of changes uh, would be required from an infrastructure standpoint that would allow them to take trips differently. So um, those are the kinds of resources that we would like to provide to the community so that they can in turn, uh, when they're asking for uh, improvements, whether it be sidewalk or, or cycling or whatever, 
there will be those resources um, to help uh, support their their request. So um, again, if there's if there's things that anybody on this call thinks would uh, be helpful to add, uh, so that uh, it does provide those kinds of resources, uh, definitely open to those suggestions. Are there any other comments or questions from anyone? All right, well, thank you, Matthew and Michael. Appreciate this opportunity to hear from about this project. It really has a lot of uh, interesting um, parts to it that can be utilized in a number of different ways. So I look forward to seeing how, how this project progresses on and we may end up getting back with you to uh, give us some more feedback on where you are with the project. Great. Thanks for having us. We'll Absolutely. Look forward to keeping you updated as this goes along. And I'll just note, uh, Sherry, that I think that's a good um, a good point about proximity to schools. That uh, because we did have some conversations about how does this program tie in and support maybe safe routes to schools and those kinds of things. So I think that's a really good, uh, a good suggestion. Well, thank you again today for, for joining us. I wanted to give an update uh, real quickly on the Upstate Conference of Plan Analysis. Uh, Kyle Duell at uh, Clemson University has been working with the upstate counties and the city of Greenville and Spartanburg uh, to take a deep dive into the similarities of each plan. Um, he is nearing completion of the, the comparison phase uh, and he has become, uh, begun the last phase of the project which is uh, looking specifically at um, the transportation elements um, and water and sewer infrastructure throughout the upstate. Um, he's going to be evaluating the commonalities in the transportation elements, um, as well as the cost of development uh, through comparing water and sewer infrastructure in Pickens County. And we're excited for Kyle's findings in these two areas. He's going to provide the um, Upstate Planners Group a presentation the first part of May. Uh, if you'd like more information on this project, let, let me or Justine know and we will get you plugged in. And we will also send out the reminders um, concerning that, uh, that date um, in early May, whenever he uh, gives that presentation to us. But um, we're interested to see some of his findings on that. Michael, do you have anything else? I uh, just wanted to mention uh, March 24th is our next meeting. And I believe Justine will be sending out uh, an invite for that uh, discussion on Spartanburg's Northside Initiative. Um, and unless Dean has anything to add or Justine, I think we are ready to be adjourned. Nope. Great job. All right. Thank you all for coming. We'll, uh, we'll speak to you soon. Take care. Thanks, Matthew. Welcome.